Hello listeners, Kathy Lawless, Life Story Curator, bringing you the podcast series, How Did I Get Here? A series of interviews designed for people just starting out in their careers, people in transition or possibly feeling stuck, and giving them access to the stories of people who've been there, done that, so that they might be inspired with some new ideas, or maybe just comforted knowing they are not alone, that everybody starts somewhere and everybody goes through times of transition and times when they feel stuck. Today, I'm very excited to be interviewing Beth Klepper. Welcome, Beth. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Ditto. And and Beth and I met through our Strategic Connections group, uh, which is part of the Colorado Thought Leaders Forum. So uh, anyway, we met, what, gosh, I think a couple years ago, but then just have gotten closer now that we were in the same in the same chapter. So definitely. And Beth is the founder of Mainstream Video Production, and she's been obsessed with video her whole life. And so this is going to be a really fun story, I think. So, but before we get into your story, uh, we like to go way back and start with the icebreaker questions, which are, you know, where did you grow up? What part of the country or world? And tell us a little bit about your family dynamics, you know, where you are in the birth order, how many siblings, and how you think all that shaped you. Absolutely. So we, I am one of four, I'm the baby, and I actually was born in Elgin, Illinois. So all my brothers and sisters were born here in Denver. And then my parents got a promotion when they were pregnant with me and moved back to El- or moved to Elgin, Illinois. I was born there and they were there for four years before they came back to Denver. And it's kind of funny because, so I'm the only, there's this house that my parents had in Aurora that all the other kids lived in besides me. And I, uh, I'm the only one that was born in Chicago, not technically a Denver native or a Colorado native because I wasn't born here. And the reason that my parents moved and came back was my dad got a big promotion and then he actually ended up getting fired uh, for this big trucking company he was working um, for and he wanted to start a business and he wanted to come back to Colorado. He wasn't made for like corporate politics. And so he had been a vice president, a big wig, and then he ended up kind of starting from the very bottom. And so we came back to Denver and were, they were, they had a paper route and de, um, delivered phone books and they built their business, which just this year they sold, which was a 27 year old business. So I think wow. it's kind of an interesting story, which weaves into mine, entrepreneur at heart and, um, yeah, we big family there. My both of my parents are actually from Omaha, and my mom is one of ten kids. So family is a, just our life. Like that is the thing that matters. It's family, and then you know, ten steps down, everything else. So um, that's kind of my my specific location was I grew up in Littleton, and so um, that's what I mostly remember. Obviously, getting here about four. That's when your memories start to kick in, yeah. and just family and being one I had several siblings you know four is a lot this day and age and then my mom was one of ten and so uh that's a little of the background from that that question so what's the age difference between you and your siblings almost two years exactly so my brother my oldest brother um is six years older than me then my next brother is four years older than my sister is two years and two weeks older than me Okay. So that was my other question too, was the whole gender. So you got two boys, Mm -hmm. two girls, you're all about two years apart. So yeah, everybody's yeah, exactly. Cool. So So what kind of activities? In growing up. So I was a swimmer. We actually, my mom always said that the world is 70% water. So everybody should learn to swim. So she had us on the swim team and we were, you know, that is a hard sport. Like as a parent, just thinking about (laughs) getting up at 6am every day. And then those swim meets are so long, but swimming and I've always been a runner. So, um, and sports, my family is a big football family. My dad, before he became a, a businessman, he was, um, drafted in the NFL actually he never ended up playing but he was all American at his college and so football sports very big football sport family and um those were the main things you know I I loved video and always tried to do an acting class or was trying to get people around the neighborhood to do stuff with me but didn't do a ton of it formally actually because it wasn't you you know you weren't in the drama club or the theater no, or anything like that in your, in your high school or yeah. Which it's, is funny. It was, it was a missed opportunity. I always regret it a little bit. I mean, cause there was, especially at college, there was a campus TV station and I always thought, 
why didn't I get in on that? I just didn't. I was much more concerned with my sorority and going to parties. I think that's the problem. Oh, okay. Now I'm a little insightful <laughs> insight. <laughs> so there you go. It's a little bit of tin for you. And in high school, I was actually really big into Senate. That was also my big thing. So I kind of running, I, I always loved control, Kathy. Like I wanted to be in charge of everything. So Senate was a natural place to be. So like, I always say that my, uh, you know, my first passion is video, but then my second passion is being the boss of me. I don't love it when people tell me how things are going to be. I like to be the one. My friends always say that, you know, you always have to have your own way. <laughs> so I, I gravitated towards planning the dances, planning the assemblies, that sort of thing. Oh. And spent, you know, most of my high school doing that swimming and then some running in cross country and track. Yeah. So would but you I say- wasn't very good at that. Yeah. I just liked it for exercise. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say track cross country. Yeah. as being the youngest that's kind of a youngest tendency is to want to be in control of things because everybody's probably been telling you what to do maybe definitely I think it's both I think it's definitely the birth order and then I think it's my constitution from the standpoint of I you know one of my superpowers that I have is emotional intelligence and I can just you know feel what people are feeling and so being, I don't know if one is, if it's a chicken or the egg thing, if I just kind of could just see my whole family dynamic, we have a lot of big personalities in my family. So I could kind of, I started to learn to manage that and kind of figure out what my role could be. And so I think, you know, it was, it was, like I said, a skill set. So I think that, and then I got to practice it a lot. And so, and then it's in my blood too. Like I said, my dad's a, he was not very good at being boss. He likes to be in control. Um, so it kind of makes sense. That's sort of a, a entrepreneur. There's a strand of DNA in the entrepreneur that likes to, likes to have the control. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, why would we do what we do? Yeah, good point. <laughs> so uh, introvert, extrovert, or ambivert? Extrovert through and through all the way. All the way. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then on the um, fun meter scale of one to five, one being couch potato and five being life of the party, where do you put yourself? I'm going to put myself at a five. I actually was voted life of the party in high school. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to have a good time. For sure. I mean, what else are we here for if it's not to laugh a lot and enjoy everything we possibly can? And you, uh, and, and then because you like to control things and kind of create activities, I'm guessing. Sure. That's also so why I, you're the, uh, the unity chair in yeah. our, in our <laughs> chapter and have been on the advisory board. So I guess Exactly. It. I yes. Okay. Typically. Okay. Uh, same scale, but this time uh, risk meter. So same scale, one to five. One being low, five being high risk taker, where do you put yourself? When I was 20, I'd put myself at a five. I would say now I'm probably at a four, three and a half, four. Um, you know, I was, I, I'm always jump in, think about it later. And these last couple of years, having a kid and having the business teach me so many lessons, I'm a little less risky little bit less, not just, I think I'm more calculated. I think I'm a smarter risky now. I was just kind of, um, recklessly risky before. Ah, okay. Uh -huh. So jump in and make it work. And jump in and like, make it work. Is this going to work? Let's figure out what's going to work and then jump in. And yeah, 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 exactly. But exactly. probably more apt to jump. Then uh, I am a hundred percent more apt to jump. I am <laughs> always like, you can try to understand the risk, but you're not going to know until you jump. Yeah. yeah <laughs> That's yeah, yeah. kind of how I feel about it, but yeah. I, okay. Being a little okay. better in my older age. Well, I, I always love these questions because it really gives us some insight into you as a person. And then as we start going through your story, everything starts to really kind of overlap and fall into place. Uh, we also sure. sometimes, uh, you know, I, I might come back and challenge you on the four to five on the risk taking, right? <laughs> yes, that's you saying, oh, no, and then I might, well, oh, maybe you're Nate. Uh, I know, I was going to say, it's actually, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, well, well, just being so comfortable being in front of a camera probably puts you higher on the risk scale than maybe a lot of people. It's true, but I will say that my career before I started my business was strategically not in front of the camera. It was strategically behind the camera as a producer. So it took a lot for me to be willing to get on the in, in front because of my business and because that's what I was selling. It was not my favorite thing to do at first, though. So I'll be oh, honest. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good to know. Good yeah. to know. The behind the camera is different than, yeah, totally, totally. Oh, big time. Than in front. Mm -hmm. Well, so since we're talking about behind and in front of the camera, tell us what it is like to be the founder of mainstream video production. And then we'll get into, how did I get here? 
how did I get here? So today, mainstream video production, we work with uh, all kinds of different businesses to help them create video production plans. So sometimes, you know, right now we're working with a construction company that needs safety videos, and we're working with a consultant, um, and consultancy agency. It's a lot of, um, you know, an agency full of consultants that have a lot of really interesting, um, you know, the education and, and helping business leaders be equipped with as much knowledge as they can as a big part of their marketing. So we film their videos and they're able to put out little, you know, snippets every week. So we work across the board. Our through line is people that really have something they want to say. They have a message they want to send and they know and are willing to use video. They know how powerful video is and they're willing to, like you said, kind of get over themselves, get in front of the camera, do what they need to do to create that video. That's that's who we serve most and what we spend most of our time doing. So for me as the founder, I am mostly primarily in the sales and you know overseeing the business role. I say founder versus CEO because founder seems a little more like, what I'm doing. I'm, I'm finding out what our processes is, what we, who we serve, how we serve them. You know, when I started in 2014, I had a, a ton of production experience. I worked at a television network for eight years. I had a master's degree in film. So I, there was, I remember driving down I-25 and being like, oh, hot tubs, I could do their videos. Nail place, I could do their videos. Bank of, you know, whatever it is. And then realizing that's not exactly how you want to run a business, how you do it. And I kind of have found our way into here's who we actually work with. Here's the way we do business. Here's the, the service we deliver. And then, you know, everything else business entails, uh, the financials and the projections. And that's where I'm most comfortable is in the talking to people and getting them excited about video. That's where I would spend 100% of my day if I could. And I do spend a, quite a bit of my day. That's, you know, networking, CTLF, that sort of thing. But then of course I have to see, okay, what did I sell? Is there a profit here? Is that's going to pay my bills? Is there, you know, a business that can support my family? Um, what about managing our team members? I have one person that's a uh, full-time employee and then a bench of contractors we work with. So it's being, you know, really in step with her and what she needs to be able to deliver to our clients and to get the team members what they need. So it's a little bit different every day. And the, again, the through line is I just want to get as many people as I can excited about using video. And if they are excited, actually doing it, that's the other thing is <laughs> there's lots of people excited and then they don't do it. So how can we get more people to, you know, face the fears because it's such a powerful medium. It's so powerful. So I want everybody to use it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your energy is boundless <laughs> uh, it's, it's just con and contagious, by the way. So, Thank you. Um, <laughs> Good. So let's, let's talk a little bit about how did I get here then? Um, you know, you mentioned you've been obsessed as a young person. So, but also that you didn't, you know, be part of a TV station and certain mm -hmm. things. So take us back to kind of junior high and high school and how you were looking at your, your career and what you were thinking you were going to go to college for and, you know, how you were going to map out your, your life being obsessed with video. Being obsessed. So, and it still happens to me all the time. I will watch a series and my entire worldview will be shaped. Like I just finished a handmaid's tale. I don't know if you've seen that, but I think differently about a million things as a result of seeing those stories on camera. And that's been happening to me since I was little. So when I, and then I want to create it. And then I would get, you know, I would watch something. I was actually so obsessed. My first movie that I was ever really obsessed with was Grease. And I uh, was obsessed with Sandy and actually insisted that everyone call me Sandy. So when we left Chicago, everybody <laughs> got shirts that had their name on it and my name had to be Sandy. So I, I just, I don't know why I feel that it's, it's, it's twofold really. It's definitely the storytelling, but it's connecting with the human. Like those are the things that are kind of both of my personalities is, you know, one of the questions that you'd sent was, you know, what's kind of your superpower. And for me, it's that that emotional intelligence I talked about earlier. I can just get a beat on what people are feeling. And I really think that's what life's about. So it's kind of, if that makes sense, it's those two things. So to answer your question, you know, I was always, I want to make this stuff. It's so cool. And then I was a human. And so in junior high, I always wanted to be an actress. That was my number one, you know, I was obsessed with video, obsessed with movies. I was going to be the star. I was going to be the Sandy, whoever. 
And in junior high, it was, I became painfully insecure. I remember, you know, just uh, one day being like going, I was, went to school and then went into the bathroom and like got a look at myself and was like, for the first time, self-aware, like never, it just never had happened to me before that. And then it was kind of wading through that, like every teenager. Mm -hmm. And there was something way too vulnerable about being an actress at that point. It was not anything that I wanted to do. I wanted to fit in. I actually wanted to be a cheerleader more than anything in the world. I got cut twice. So that's a definitely a, a failure um, that probably worked out for the best, but I wanted to be a cheerleader. I wanted to be popular. I wanted to be, you know, the life of the party. And that that's still, you know, all of that has its shadow side and its light side. So that was all driving me when I was young. I didn't know better. Um, so I, I didn't go into acting. I didn't go into drama. That would have been just way too vulnerable for me, way too, um, I just didn't have that I was just too insecure. So I was in Senate though, as I mentioned. So that was a safer place to be where it was like, I could control these things. You know, here are the building blocks. We're planning a dance. We have to get this permission. That's that's a little bit more manageable than art and putting yourself <laughs> out there as an actress and being a character and not just didn't, couldn't do it. And, uh, and that was fine. And then one of the bigger things that shaped me was I was a student at Columbine in, two, in 1999. So I graduated in 2000 and this was a big, you know, so for, 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 I was just trying to fit in and be one of the cool kids and then, and just loved media and loved everything about films and television. Um, and wasn't, I mean, at that point, I just wasn't concerned with what I was going to do. It was just not, you know, uh, somehow I knew I'd get there, but like I said, I was not, that wasn't the priority. And then when Columbine happened, it was such a paradigm shift for every, like every single thing. It was like a new dimension, you know, the next morning waking up and just seeing the world completely differently and deconstructing that and saying, okay, what does this mean for how all the things I value? And it put me in this very, uh, student mindset for studying media. So I remember like reading news reports and I, and I still have a, I'm not a big fan of news to this day because new, you know, a, a movie that we watch, A Handmaid's Tale, it's supposed to be fiction, right? It's not supposed to be the truth. And the news is, right? Like those are, you got to pay attention to the news. You got to pay attention to what's going on. Well, those are stories too. They just have, you know, they, they're, you know, the things that they were putting on TV about Columbine were not the truth of Columbine. You know, they were stories of Columbine that they'd gotten from this person's perspective and that person's perspective. And there was some truth in it, but it wasn't the truth. It wasn't the only thing. And it was very eye-opening to realize and, and to think about how did this happen and how could, you know, this high school in the middle of white suburbia in Littleton, you know, be have this horror show what contributed to that was it gun laws was it media was it video games is it the parents is it the police I mean it was this huge questioning of all of that and that's you know what clouded a lot of my um you know senior year and then when I went to college I went to CSU and about that time I realized uh, you know, before I got into communication classes, I was just an okay student. And then I started studying communication and it was, this was, you know, my, more my favorite than anything. It was like, yes, I loved video and yes, I wanted to be an actress, but that was only from the, you know, being cool kind of through, through line, if that makes sense. When I started really studying what it is and how it shapes our whole society and the impact it has that's when I started to get really excited about it and understand its power. And so I went and studied abroad in, in at CSU in London. And again, another paradigm shift, studying abroad is just this great experience. And I, I really got into the rhetoric of it and media studies and what does it mean? And how do we, you know, how do we decide what is a cool teenager? And if you're not a cool teenager, you're the outcast. And what does that mean? And you're watching video games and you have access to guns and, you know, like all of that became really interesting to think about. And I wanted to study it. And if I was going to create films and if I was going to be part of that industry, which I knew somehow I always would, I needed to 
understand it on a deeper level. So I um, ended up going to grad school for film and visual culture. So there was two kind of main ideas or main programs I was looking at. One was a broadcast, which was a very practical degree. And one was a theory degree about understanding film and visual cultures, which is, you know, kind of anything art since the seventies. And I went with a theory degree. So I always joke that in grad school, we never picked up a camera or shot anything. We talked about film and wrote about film and analyzed film and what did it mean and how does it work and why is it shaping people's uh you know is it a chicken and an egg thing from you know here's what the film is and so this is what people think they need to be or people think they need to be this and so that's what's on film and really kind of going in depth about that and at one time I thought I was going to be an academic and just fully a professor teaching it and um that was, that was as far as my film career was going to take me or not career, but that's, that was my, going to be my place in film. Of yeah. course. Wow. So uh, you, uh, just yeah. hearing this bit so far, you've explored so many different parts of video yes. and filming. And like you said, it's <laughs> like you've been obsessed, but yeah. also <clears throat> you've been uh, a student and a researcher and a, you Definitely. know, and, and then also, a, but actively involved in it and, fi- you know, figuring it out. And what is it that's, that's jazzing you, right? And you follow, right, totally you know, giving you energy at the time down the communications path and, and yeah. influence it. Wow. Very interesting. Well, and that was, you know, what I remember though, distinctly after about a semester of grad school, I was out on being an academic. I was ah, like, <laughs> not for me, not for me. I was like, I cannot just talk about it. Like, I love talking about it, but I cannot just talk about it and think about it. I want to do it and see what works. And, and so, it, which was great because, like I said, I was like at one point going to be a professor and this was the path. And then it was like, no, I, I got to get into it. And the problem from, well, not the problem, but I was studying abroad. So I studied abroad in London and that's actually where I went to grad school. So I'd gone back abroad and I thought, oh, you know, I'll have to move to New York or LA if I want to work in the industry. And I'm not really ready to do that. I'm not ready to work uh, or move again because I'd been in London. I wanted to come back home. I kind of mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, like family's number one. And being in London was one of those experiences that made me realize like, oh yeah, I don't, I don't love being an eight hour plane right away for my family. I, you know, can't come home for a funeral or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I came back to Denver and just thinking, well, I'm not going to be able to work in uh, television or film as long as I'm in Denver, but I do have this degree in uh, film. So I'll pursue, I have a master's degree in communication. So I'll, I'll pursue teaching and I'll work for my dad who I mentioned his business earlier. So he had a, he has a fleet repair business. So they, you know, uh, needed somebody to answer the phones and, you know, deposit the checks. And so I was like, well, I'll work for him and I'll try to get a job teaching, teaching communication classes at a college. So I did that. And then actually very serendipitously there turns out there was a television network here and uh, through networking, my dad's network, I was able to get an interview as a production assistant at the network. And so I started working as a production assistant and now in, so that was in 2006. Then I got to get some actual hands on, like, let's actually make some stuff. Cause I didn't know how to make anything. Cause as I mentioned, I wasn't in a drama club or I didn't join the broadcast. I was very in my head to go way back to your question about, you know, the experiences in junior high and high school. I was just in my head. I wasn't, you know, in the world yet. <laughs> yeah. So you, you weren't will. the kid that was following around your friends and family members with the video. Uh, a little as bit. A I, person. As a, yes, I will say there are plenty of very hard to watch videos of me <laughs> falling around the family, but that kind of stopped at about like 12 or 13. Yeah. Yeah. And then it was just in your head, you were going to make something fantastic, but you hadn't really what? done it. No, I, I hadn't that. done it. And I didn't even know it, it was just like, I, I just got to fit in. It was like, once, once I got to that age, it was like, how do I fit in? And the drama club, no disrespect to the drama club, but that wasn't the, that wasn't where you fit in. You know no, what I mean? I mean, no. <laughs> You get but it. If you're really, really into it, you fit in with that small group. Yeah. But that was not, yeah, the bigger no. mainstream of the, yeah, to- totally. Totally, and that's what is is interesting for me because I, you know, that's a regret and not a regret because I am who I am and I I experience the world the way I experience the world. But I would have had a great time with the drama kids. You know, I would have had that would have been a great experience had I been able to, you know, I guess delineate that I was not a cool kid. I was not a cheerleader. 
but I didn't have that confidence. And yeah. to the goods that do, good for them. Well, I gotta say, me. I think everybody in a, in that age group thinks somebody else is more popular. True. Got, got their act together more than I do. They know what they're doing. And really everybody, at, no matter what stage, you know, you talk to even the ones who were like the king and queen of the prom. Oh, 100%. And they're like, oh no, I wasn't the popular kid. So-and-so was, and you're like, no, it was you. And they're like, no, it wasn't me. Uh, there so was always true. someone that they could point to. <laughs> yeah, we so all true. had the insecurity. And then if we could just be comfortable with ourselves and go, hey, this is my, this, this is my jam. This is what my superpower. Yes. I should just stick with my people. And uh, whoever those might be so yeah oh there exactly. okay so you got your master's degree in london mm -hmm. which again mm -hmm. great perspective because it's really looking at us probably from an outside perspective which 100%. is what you do as a videographer as well uh -huh. right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, as well mm -hmm. as just outside the country out outside the demographic and all the being in it in the yeah yeah interesting it was it was awesome so you got you're working at the at the tv station and mm -hmm. how is that are you loving it you're like this is it i found it definitely at, at first particularly so when i started there so it was interesting because it's owned by mark cuban it was owned by mark cuban i believe he sold it a couple years ago so it was it had some cachet you know mark cuban is a big name mm -hmm. and it was in this one of the old stapleton uh continental hangers uh that's where the network was so everything came through there and they had just right before i started dan rather had been fired from cbs or wherever he was fired from i believe it was cbs but anyway he got a, a show on the network and that kind of changed up everything it was very exciting for the network and they had an opening for me so i worked on i was I was, I remember going into the interview and seeing the master control, which is like, you know, just tons of video. Like It was like, this is where I'm supposed to be. And I remember saying that in my interview and just being so confident and being like, there's not another choice. Like I have, like I, this exists in Denver 10 minutes from where I live. I'm working here. No more questions. <laughs> Even if you don't and pay me, I'm going to come in every day. <laughs> <laughs> and when I got the, it was just one of those, such a serendipitous moment. And it was, I worked with the best people on that project. Um, actually the person that works for me now was one of my first bosses at the TV network. So, oh, wow. um, so it was a great, uh, full circle moment when she came to work for mainstream, but, uh, I worked on a TV show called Deadline, which was a irreverent news show. So we had all kinds of camera people in different cities throughout the world covering eccentric events like cheese rolling in England, where they roll a bunch of cheese down the hill and people chase after it. And then we had a host out of LA and we would write the scripts for her. And then once a week she would come in and would do a green screen. And so I learned a green screen. I learned scripting. It was a big enough network that we were doing some of these cool things, but small enough that pretty much my first week, I was writing a script. So I wasn't just, you know, working for Fox, getting coffee. I was really getting in there, worked with editors. I worked on that show for about two or three years. And then actually Stephanie, who works for me now, she, her husband had gotten laid off in the big 2008 ordeal and they moved to San Francisco for a job for him. And so the structure of the network changed. And I actually ended up working for somebody um, his name was Evan Heyman and he was out of New Jersey and he was the vice president of music and entertainment, which was a huge opportunity for me because he was the big wig of music and entertainment at the network. And I got a chance to basically manage the show under him, prove myself to him. And a couple of years later, got a promotion and started working on their concerts and the entertainment division. I was just working on one show and then I moved up to working on concerts and on a couple shows. And then at one point I was working on all the entertainment shows. My boss was in charge of music and entertainment. He really cared about the music and the live shows and the con, uh, not live at this point, the concerts, all of that. And then we had 10 different entertainment shows that I would oversee in some capacity. Some of them were wow, delivered. That seems like so, a pretty big jump and, and you were pretty young, I'm guessing. That's Yeah, it was definitely my 20s, late 20s was, I was probably, yeah, at that point. And it was, it was, it was, like Evan was, if you proved yourself to Evan, he trusted you with everything. And I got so many incredible opportunities because of him, because he knew I could do it. He didn't want to do it. So we got, or he was more focused on the music stuff. And so I got to do, you know, we would have different acquisitions. So we would have some shows would come completely finished and then it would just be my job to watch them and make sure they were approved. Some we had to produce from scratch. Some we, they filmed in New York and then we edited here. And so I 
I worked with a ton of different personalities and I reported to Evan and I reported to the vice president of programming. So I had to learn the politics and make sure that Rachel was happy. And I like, if the show wasn't delivered, it could definitely be, it was definitely the production company's fault, but Rachel was going to call me on it, you know? So I had to figure out how to manage them to do my job with Rachel. And one of the shows I worked on was uh, filmed in New York and edited here. It was called Naughty But Nice with Rob. It was a celebrity gossip show. And it was it was one of the harder things I ever had to take on because they shot it and we edited here and I had to manage editors. And I was pretty young at the time and I was managing editors that I started with as a production assistant. And they made things very hard on me. And as much as that was some of the worst working years of my life, I learned, I became such a good producer, having them challenge my every single decision that I made and, you know, push back every chance they got. So I learned a ton at the network and it was, I got to go to the Super Bowl. We got to go to red carpet events at the Academy Awards. I got to do all kinds of travel and really fun, awesome stuff and also learn the practical piece of production and the working with the contractors and what does it take to bring this together and just the technical stuff you know camera footage logging tape all of that and it was it was awesome for so long and it sounds like maybe working with difficult people <laughs> oh my gosh and that was the thing so in two, so where kind of i transitioned was in 2012 i kind of you know evan was the top of the network at least for where i wanted to go and he was fairly young at the time still probably fairly young but he wasn't going anywhere so i'd kind of gone up as high as i could go up i couldn't get any more um money there which is another story but i kind of capped out at my raise and so I uh, started thinking, okay, maybe it's time to move on. What does that look like? Now I bought a house in Denver. I can now, now I was more willing to move to New York or LA, but oh God, I'm going to, I'm kind of got roots here again. And is that really what I want to do? And then the network actually merged. So acts, so it was, it was HGNet when I started and they merged with AEG concert promoters and became access live. And the whole goal of this was to do live programming, like cable television is all about live. Everything we put on the air is going to be live. So that I thought, okay, I'm going to stick around for this. I'm going to see what happens next. This is yeah, that's new and different and kind new, of bold. Yeah. totally bold. And it was, uh, at that point, they separated the music and entertainment department. So I was mostly doing music. I'm sorry, I was mostly doing entertainment. And now Evan was just going to be in charge of music. So I could either move to LA or maybe move to LA. There might be an opportunity in entertainment, but I decided I'm going to stay with Evan and just transition to the music department. So, the, um, so that was 2012, and I worked on live concerts. And we were the goal was to get as much live content out as we possibly could. So we were getting out three live shows a week on our biggest weeks. So we would film at Red Rocks and at the Ogden and in other cities, and we were doing festivals. And live TV was, I learned so much. I mean, that is the emergency room of production. I mean, you don't have time. You've got to do, you got to like, and talk about difficult personalities. I always joke that like the music business is an oxymoron. There's no such thing as a music business um, because they're musicians, they're artists. And then I'm working with their managers to get everything approved by their managers. My job was the segments producer. So I had to provide everything that wasn't the actual concert. So any of the intros, if there was like a behind the scenes segment with the band, I had to figure out like when we could interview them, go to the interview, edit that together, then get that all ready for the production truck. And we had to get the band's approval before we could get any of it to the truck. And we would sign contracts for a concert on Tuesday on Thursday. So I'd be working, hoping that we were going to sign a contract, but also couldn't formally get anything done because we don't have a contract signed. And so it was a very high, high stress. And it was like, okay, I don't, the live TV is not for me. This is not, I mean, I told you like my, like a philosophical, like I want to think about things and how we're going to do this. This is, this is not where my career is going to go. What do I do now? That was what I kind of had to wrestle with. And I, like I said, I started thinking about that and I always wanted to start my own company and I wanted to start a film company though. So in grad school, I, my biggest area of study was in audiences. So I was the outcast in, in grad school because I don't love 
painful indie movies. I like a movie like Titanic. I like a movie that entertains me from captivates me and start like from start to finish, not one that's hard to watch. And, and I believe that that's what gives those films power. Like the ones that shape us the most are the ones that people want to watch. And I always got pushback about that in grad school. I mean, people, when people would find out that my favorite movie was Titanic, it was just like, they couldn't take it. And I, <laughs> like, oh, you're one of those. Okay. Yes. And I was like, <laughs> how can you I, be serious in the film industry? Yes. If it's all about feeling good, huh? <laughs> yes. Yes. And I, that was my argument was that they, this, that those are the movies that have power, whether or not you like it, those are the movies that have power. And I'm going to start a film company one day and it's going to be, you know, shaping the world, but it's going to, uh, they're going to be films that people like, and I'm going to call it mainstream just because mainstream is kind of a dirty word. Yeah. And that's, but it's not because that's the power. That's where it is. Whether you like it or not, that's, you got to entertain and captivate before you can change people. And uh, so I always knew I was going to start that, but I didn't know what that meant. I mean, in my, in grad school, it was like a motion picture company. Mm -hmm. In reality, I'm not starting a motion picture company. I need to pay my mortgage, you know? Yeah. So I kind of just sat with it for a little bit. I was really unhappy in my job for a long time. I mean, it was glamorous and awesome. We got to go to, uh, you know, festivals, concert, you know, jazz fest and that sort of thing. And I, that wasn't what I wanted to do at all. Yeah. And well, then, you were at these great places, but you're yeah. probably running around behind the scenes, pulling your hair out, trying to track yes. down these artists and their managers. Yes. And they're like, I don't want to deal with you right now. And you're like, yes. but if we don't get this contract signed here, we can't do the segment mm -hmm. there and this and mm -hmm. that. And what do you mean they're not mm -hmm. going to show up? And yeah, I totally. Oh gosh. Yes, I, that was my life. I've done it enough was... events through different uh -huh. organizations and they're just events like conferences and, you know, but aligning, you know, that we had speaker handlers and all that. And some of the drama, you're just like, are you kidding me? Oh my God. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's 90% of what it is. You're not really, especially in live, because you're not, you weren't creating anything. It was just about getting something on air. Yeah. You know, it was like as quick as you could to get something on air. And some of the stuff you're really proud of, but most of it, you're only proud because it made it to air. You know, <laughs> that's what makes but you proud. finally it's there and I'm, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> so, exactly. So, so Beth, you talk about, you know, so there's the whole expertise around film and video and running and production and all of that, but there's also managing all these people. Did you have some training on, you know, obviously you had a communications degree, but was that in you know, critical conversations or leadership or business, uh, you know, management and all of that stuff. I am, and maybe no. you're going to get to that. Uh, well, and actually be in you. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, like I said, that's, that's part of my superpower is I can just, I think if you can understand people's true emotions, you're cutting through 90% of everything. Yeah, right. I mean, you mm -hmm. don't, you don't need, and that was what I could do. I could see you're upset. You're and, and if, if people can connect that way, right? You don't, you don't feel as harshly towards someone when you know they're scared. You yeah. don't feel, you know, that you have to battle somebody who is angry because of a fear, you know, it just kind of getting to that kind of, that was the superpower I brought. But I, I, I will also add that while I was pursuing the job at the network, I did end up getting a job teaching. So I teach public speaking and interpersonal communication at Metro. So actually teaching interpersonal communication is probably, you know, where I learned a ton as well. I mean, I had a sense of it and, there, you know, it's, it's 101, it's relationships 101 and reading that book and having to prepare lectures for that absolutely influenced it. And then just, you know, my goal was to be approved of by Rachel and by Evan. And if this wasn't working, I had to pivot you know, that's how it was. It was like, okay, I can't, I can't call Rachel and say the show's not ready because Chris is being a jerk to me. I have to figure out how to work with Chris. What does Chris want? What's Chris think? Like, that was always, I was so motivated by this need for approval that I found a way to do it. And then you learn and you realize, oh, this worked. This doesn't work at all, you know? And then of course, studying it a little bit on the side as well. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, okay. So this is where I'm going to put you on the risk meter way okay. over. <laughs> <laughs> right over on the eight to 10 scale, because yeah, to get, to get a live production event out, yeah, um, that's I mean, true. everything you're doing is live <laughs> and you're the one making it happen, yeah. even though the people on, but also the people on stage, you got to know are like, well, but you got to make this work. You got to make me look good. Right. That's right. You're like, Absolutely. But I'm, help me make you look good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this, exactly. And oh you're holding gosh, me yeah. out here. <laughs> yeah. 
and there was it, yes and so many personalities because it wasn't just me there was a director and the TD and the producers and and dealing with all of that to to make to win was was a challenge and not yeah. one that was altogether fulfilling which is why I started thinking, you know, what does this next stage look like? And some freelance work fell in my lap. So that's kind of how mainstream, you know, somebody called me and said, Hey, you know, you, it was a friend of my dad's. We, cause my dad's a business person. So he's very well networked. Hey, we know you're, you're in production and we have a, a video. We have a new truck that is very technical. We need a training video. Can you make that for us? And I was like, yeah, I can make that for you. And so we did that video and then we had another one fall on our lap and I had to create an LLC because, and I was, of course knew what the LLC was going to be called um, because I'd already planned that in grad school. So I And who started, was we at this point? You it was, were saying we. It was always, I always have a bench of contractors. So I had a, on this one, because I had a full-time job, I had to hire a producer, one, somebody that had worked with me that had been laid off. I hired him to, to produce it. And then we had a shooter and an editor. So we, and then of course the client. So we together produced, and then I had actually hired an on-air talent because they needed somebody to host the video. So I got my brother to do it and, um, you know, manage the cost, all of that. And then I worked with the second video that we did that was recruiting videos. I, we shot in Alabama. So I had to hire crews local to Alabama and work with those oh, guys, wow. which, which I knew how to do because that's what I did at the network. You know, when we had that first show I worked on, we worked with shooters in every single city in America. So I all, and if they couldn't do it, they knew who to call. So I, and, and you knew how to vet them, you knew what to questions to ask and if they were going to be good to work with and what their rate was going to be. And so that was the Genesis. And I started thinking, okay, I, I could do this full time. I was having more fun doing that than I had had the last two and a half years doing live or probably even before that I was having so much fun setting up the productions, being in charge and which you like to do, which, which you like, I to, like be. to do. Which so I, I do have to ask, were you, I almost think you, you had to have had some physical cost oh, that's at the pace totally that you're crazy. describing. <laughs> I mean, were you, yeah, were you, okay. Yes. So we, and it was, um, and it was one of my first lessons was I had to pay all of these people before I got paid. And one of the clients didn't pay me for like six months. And my dad lent me the money to pay the contractors. And my dad was a, he is a no BS guy. And he hounded me for the money every single day. And it was a very painful lesson. And I actually ended up like clearing out a mutual fund just to get him off my back, which it didn't. He still was like, did you get paid? Did you get paid? And, you know, his lesson was there are wannabes for sure in business and you have got to get the money. And there was a, I found this blog later. It was like three business three tips, three business tips from this like big music mogul that I had to send to my dad because it was just perfect. It was number one is get the money. Number two is remember to get the money. And number three is don't forget get to the remember money. to get the money. And I love that. I love that. <laughs> that's what business is. You know, I mean, I, I've done plenty of stuff for free for friends. I just made my parents a 50th wedding anniversary video. That, but when you're in business, like that is such a huge part of it. And, you know, the cash flow piece and when is the money coming in and when is it going out and looking at all of that was like, that was that stuff I've had to learn, but there was definitely costs and there's, you know, I'm still definitely, I didn't know what the cost would be and I didn't have a plan. I did not have a financial business plan. I thought I'm a great producer. I'm extroverted as it gets. I go talk to a million people. This is going to work itself out. Yeah. Not exactly. Not exactly. Yeah. Thanks for lines of credit and things like that to make it work. <laughs> yeah yeah sort of so yeah. lesson lesson learned there and then how to uh you know the business side of it and the selling side of it you, you, you knew yeah. you could crush it on the delivery side right but it was about 100%. sales the pipeline the business the you know acquiring well, the, the job so I, and one of the things I didn't realize was that people weren't going to the people I was dealing with didn't know production they didn't know what it should cost or why it would cost that much. And so I had to learn how to sell it from that standpoint and say, you know, okay, here's what, um, here's, here's why we're different than a videographer down the way. And maybe you don't need it, but here's also why we're less expensive than these big agencies and maybe why you don't need that. And if you don't have the budget for this, I can't, 
I can't make concessions. I mean, I definitely did the first couple of clients, mm -hmm. but then learned like if I charge you $500 and I make 600, that's, or make, if it costs me 700, I, that's business. Yeah, that's not good. That's not good. <laughs> not a good business model. Yes. Dad exactly. would be mad. Uh-huh. Uh -huh, absolutely. <laughs> when yeah. I come in and say, I'm not making any money, but I'm so busy. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, Beth, exactly. man, I, could, we, I know we could keep chatting all afternoon. I have a, you know, a ton of questions about when she got started, but we probably do need to start wrapping up. So um, tell us what way. you think has served you best when you look back on your career, you know, a, a strength or a habit or, a, um, you know, a discipline. I, I think, and this kind of goes into like kind of advice I would give my earlier self is having a really good attitude about things that don't go your way. I, I think I did it begrudgingly. You know, I talked about those editors that kind of made my life just terrible for a couple of years, but that's how I became the producer that knew how to get exactly what I wanted and how to make sure that, you know, things got delivered on time. So, and I just think that's the way that you've heard that saying, like either you win or you learn. And I think that how you win is by what you've learned. So just, and, and now I have such a better attitude when things go badly and not my way, just, okay, this, there's a lesson here that is going to be so valuable. That is going to make us so happy later down the road. And like, can I just find that? Yes. You're going to feel upset and frustrated and sad and bummered. And all of that is important to feel, but I also don't think you need that much help feeling that. I think the negative is really easy to just like, mm -hmm. it's, I've heard it's described as like a uh, Velcro where focusing on the, the lesson and the greater good. Like, I think I always did it as a habit and I try to do it more intentionally as a habit now. Yeah. So now you're more aware of it. So it was, it was in you and mm -hmm. you probably had to rally yourself and the troops when you were dealing with difficult people. And mm -hmm. then you're like, Oh, wait a minute, this does work. <laughs> Yep. And it works right. for me and it's going to work in the next scenario and the next scenario. So right. let's make it a part of it. <laughs> and let's feed that instead of feeding the complaints. Yeah. The complaints that just give us down and you, yeah, and you end up, okay, we still have the deadline to meet and we're no further along. <laughs> and stuff. Yeah, uh -huh, totally. Yes. Okay. And then last question, any words of wisdom that impacted you that, you know, you'd like to share with others? That's a good one. I mean, I think one of um, my, one of the things that Rachel, who was the vice president said to me, and this is just so specific about our business, but I think it's, it was an important distinction is that, you know, when you get something into, when you take your real life and then you put it on video, it's diluted to just 10% of the actual energy it was in real life, you know? Um, and, and when you're creating video to just remember that, it's not too specific um, as far as bigger life lessons, but that's been a huge thing for me in terms of how we make great messages and how we send and create, produce great videos is just creating that energy that isn't there is the art of video um, production and what, why you'd hire someone like us or, or that sort of thing. And then I just heard this quote today. So it seems like it's cheating, but I, it is all it, like, it's the perfect quote. I'm going to use it for the rest of my life. This is just the first time I'm using it is don't ask for a lighter pack, ask for a stronger back. And I just think that goes back mm -hmm. to, you know, not focusing on how frustrated you are, but like, let's try to, let's try to figure out what this is here for and, and go in that direction. Yeah. 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 It's almost like that notion of, well, there's circumstances and then there's what you're committed to, right? Yes. The lighter pack, if you, you know, then you're asking for someone else to help you with it or control it, or if it wasn't these circumstances, I could manage it. But if I have a stronger back, then it doesn't matter what it. the pack is, right? Because I know I can get through it. Wow. Totally. Okay. Well, totally first bad. time used, well used. <laughs> Thank you. First Nailed time, it. but not last time. And you heard it here first. That's what <laughs> I didn't come up with it. Somebody else did, but that's first time I've used it as, yeah. a, awesome. as an anchor. Well, and I got to tell you, your, your, your EQ and your ability to get, um, you know, feel people's emotions and kind mm -hmm. of what's going on. You have to bring that, it sounds like, to the video in order to make the video, because it is only 10% of all the energy, that's probably what, you know, you, uh -huh. you know how to get that out of people. And I see that in you. So 
Very Definitely. Cool. And that's, I mean, that's one of the things that I think is what I love to do about what we do now is I see a business and I see the owner or whoever we're working with. And it's so, I can cut right to it and be like, here's why this is amazing. Here's where your heart is on this. Here's why. And we get that feedback all the time that like, you got it. Like I knew, I knew it sort of, but now you've articulated it in a script and it's, you know, that's, that's kind of how it all ties together for us. So I do think we are, you know, all these people whose videos we make, they're doing such incredible stuff. And then we're just giving them this mag, you know, megaphone to tell more people about it and help more people. It's just awesome. On a grander scale, because on they don't have scale. to do it themselves one on right. whatever is out there in the on their and website we, in this media and yeah totally and we don't have to do anything great we just get to magnify everybody's greatness <laughs> and that makes us doing our great thing you know <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome so. well beth it has been such a pleasure oh Thank my gosh you for Kenny, I get your to story talk to you in and day, your energy sure. and your quote now that uh we can yes. all uh, benefit from so <laughs> on that note anytime I'll start- I'll start to wrap up. Um, So listeners, if you enjoyed today's interview, please subscribe below so you'll be alerted when other interviews are published. And if you have any questions for me or for Beth, I will, you can post those on my website, lifestorycurator.com. So I'll post her social media links and all the ways that you can get a hold of her. Cause after this interview, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people saying, Hey, (laughs) maybe I need this for my business. So yes. Thank you, Kathy. On that note, I'll say stay safe, stay well, and let's keep sharing those stories. Have a great day.